your video and your audio, but your presence will still be recorded. After this, I will not be able to communicate with you. And Lama will be joining, but not actually in the room yet. Please start Mikazuma now-ish. Okay. All right. Let's go. <clears throat> Okay. Start with very good. Start with seven line prayer, Lama. Yes. Okay, just checking. Who? Oh, 
Shakyamuni Buddha, teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, Foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened the Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened the Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, then you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom, 
like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, to bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create, by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kanya Yata Yami. The heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra are the Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavat was dwelling on Massa Vultures Mountain on Raja Griha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. 
Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Valakiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Valakiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Valukiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhi, soha. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, Parasangate bodhi soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate buddhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Valakiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharavati Putra, the Mahasattva Arya Varukateshvara, 
those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. To fulfill the needs of beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate also the, uh, you know, the visuals uh, along with the text. Um, that's wonderful. So uh, for people um, that maybe are new, or maybe there's no newcomers, I don't know, uh, these uh, prayer meditations are meant to prepare us uh, to listen to Dharma. So hopefully I speak Dharma today. Uh, prayers cover uh, the three turnings of the wheel, uh, the foundational teachings, and uh, the Prajnaparamita and also the tantric so uh we we covered it all like that so thank you <clears throat> uh, it's important to do uh some narrative meditations uh or prayers to establish a receptivity and uh, a confidence and a sense of open-heartedness um not only before our talk of course but uh, before our meditation it is possible just to uh, start meditating, just sit there, uh, that too. But uh, we found that uh, if you just check in with your motivation and your open heartedness and check in with your uh, emotions, uh, you're going to have a more powerful, uh, more calm, more insightful meditation. So in Mahayana and in Tantra, uh, we, we use the energy of our enlightened emotions uh, are uncontrived, uh, unconditioned uh, energies. Um, and we don't try to block them, but we do try to transform the uh, confused and uh, conflicting energies. So uh, that's a big job, of course, and that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about today. But I'm going to stick to topic and uh, the topic is talking about community. So I wanted a little bit of break from talking about the links or the Madonnas, uh, because next uh, talk, we're going to be enjoy, uh, enjoy the presence and participation of Kenshin Nirvishe. And uh, the next uh, link that we're talking about is uh, consciousness. So um, be consciousness raising people. <laughs> if you want to be there for that talk. Uh, so consciousness is very important, like that. So uh, can people hear me okay? Yeah, all right, good. We have good technology. Uh, we're going to have more technology um, as we go along um, because eventually uh, I want to see people here in the Gopa and uh, I don't want to have a screen in front of me, but uh, we're taking... Uh, advice, uh, Dharma advice, and uh, medical advice, and legal advice to uh, go slow enough so that uh, we're waiting until Sacramento County uh, raises up a few colors in its tier so that when people come, we have as much confidence in our safety as possible. I myself have um, received both of the vaccinations, uh, and I'm feeling better as a result of that psychologically too. Uh, and I encourage people uh, to uh, take care of their health in this way when uh, their vaccinations become uh, available like that. So <clears throat> community, and specifically at this point, I wanted to talk about um, uh, the yoga, yogic or the yogi community because the traditional way of talking about uh, Buddhist community is the fourfold Sangha, you know, monks and nuns, householders, um, <clears throat> female and male householders, nuns and monks, like that. But there's um, like a fifth category 
um, the uh, yogi sangha, um, which uh, can permeate all four of those, but um, specifically, I'm interested in talking about uh, a group of people that are doing intense uh, yogic practices uh, that don't fit into the monastic framework or fit into the typical um, classical householder framework. Typical householder framework is uh, people are working on gaining uh, positive potentials, sometimes called merit, and they're uh, supporting uh, monastics, they're supporting dharma, and they're, they're being good people, but uh, they don't have the teachings or the time to do uh, the intense yogic practices. So, uh, Growing up in the West, I mean, uh, I, sometimes uh, people get uh, very colonial and condescending, and they think, well, uh, these householders um, uh, in Asia, uh, they weren't trying very hard. They, um, they should have been um, you know, doing yogic practices too, right? I've heard that over the years. They should be, you know, uh, they're they're just devotees, or they're just into rituals. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of kind of downplaying of uh, traditional, um, you know, temple Buddhism and uh, traditional householders. Well, uh, if people in the audience are honest, uh, it's very difficult as someone who's a household in a sense we're keeping house going, we're keeping a family going, we're keeping a job going, we're just keeping our health going, to uh, devote a lot of time to our training and practice. Isn't that so? It's difficult, right? <clears throat> uh, I regularly ask people, uh, how much time you know, do you have for meditation? And sometimes it's just minutes, you know? So, um, uh, it's it is difficult, and uh, traditional householder practice uh, is is difficult too. If you're actually trying to really follow an ethical lifestyle, if you're really trying to build a better community, if you're really trying to support others too, on top of that, that are going on retreat or decide to live in intentional communities called uh, monasteries, whether uh, female or male. So uh, householder practice uh, is very difficult. And in fact, um, uh, monks and nuns that are traditional um, would say, oh, I, I, feel, I feel sorry for families and householders. They have to work so hard and they have so many problems. I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, I have the support that I can have a simple life and, and do my training and practice. So they're very grateful and they understand how hard we work if we're supporting others and uh, trying to be good and trying to do some practice ourselves. <clears throat> so uh, householder practice uh, where we're maintaining our communities and jobs and family and health uh, is very difficult. And uh, any, any practice, any training formally on the cushion we do is magnificent. So uh, when people come to me and they say, oh, I feel bad, um, uh, I'm not doing very much training, I've been sick, or this COVID, or um, my cat's sick, or my dog's sick, or uh, I said, don't, don't say that. Okay, so uh, I sometimes ask people, are you a householder? They go, well, I guess I am. And I said, well, you're, you're, you're doing a lot, okay? Uh, so you can do this. <laughs> But uh, if you define yourself as a yogi or a yogini, um, then, uh, then you might have to be a little tougher on yourself, right? So then that's a little different category. So um, yogi, yogini means you're actually um, doing a lot of training. You're doing the yogas. Um, so we, we actually call a lot of times our uh, 
formal training uh, yoga. Um, so uh, we, we may not belong to a yoga studio at the shopping center or the mall, um, but uh, we're doing yoga. We're doing uh, technically in the new translation schools, um, we're doing Anatara Tantra Yoga if we're practicing uh, both new translation schools and uh, ancient translation schools, then we're also doing Ati Yoga, right? So we're doing yoga, you know, like that. So um, uh, most of the yogas uh, that we're familiar with are the inner yogas, but um, we have a long tradition of doing uh, yogas that involve uh, you know, body and energy movements. Uh, those are sometimes just called uh, salon practices. And um, uh, those practices uh, have generally been secret and um, reserved after someone has done some ethical training and uh, done some retreats and had some teachings and uh, has correct relationship with the teacher and the Sangha. So I'm willing to give the Salam teachings and look forward to that, um, you know, for people that are appropriate. So I just want to reiterate that we we will be doing those. <clears throat> uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff on the uh, internet on YouTube, and um, uh, some of it's really pretty good, you know. Uh, but uh, we also need to do it in person with someone because um, generally, if we're watching YouTube uh, or reading a book, um, then uh, it's not talking back to us uh, and uh, it's not correcting us, right? So uh, we need a human teacher for that uh, generally. So I look forward to doing that. <clears throat> The uh, accomplishment of the yogic practices uh, in India and in Tibet uh, were called Mahasiddhas, <clears throat> uh, great uh, uh, success people, um, uh, great accomplishment people. Um, I think uh, some translators, uh, Jeffrey Hopkins, made, call, called them adepts. It's not a word we use generally, <laughs> great adepts. Um, and I've given teachings on the 84 Mahasiddhas um, in the past. But uh, I have an aspiration if, if someone uh, uh, is a householder but also wants to be a yogi, uh, then uh, you can pat yourself on the back for being a good householder if you're doing some training but then I have to uh, inspire you to become a Mahasiddha if you're doing also some yoga. <clears throat> we, do, we do make an um, aspiration in the prayers and meditations uh, to uh, become Buddhas for Buddhahood, which means that all uh, the positive qualities have uh, opened up and flowered and uh, all the delusions have disappeared so that you have all the qualities that are enumerated in the uh, Julama. Uh, it sounds, uh, that's Tibetan for the Anuttara Tantra Shastra. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the people watching, some of you are doing the Buddha Dharma study pro program should uh, easily be able at this point to tick off the seven Vajra points of the Shastra, right? <laughs> Uh, okay, no test today, All right? No test. So, <clears throat> but of course, uh, in that uh, text from Maitreya, as channeled through the Sangha, uh, we're talking about the, uh, you know, the radiant awareness of uh, the mind and how the Buddha qualities are expressed uh, through bliss and permanence and uh, self. So I'm looking forward to uh, my next Monday night talk on that. But uh, these qualities are uh, brought to complete fruition um, in the Mahasiddhas, who uh, would also be, uh, of course, 
uh, regarded as Buddhas too, but uh, the emphasis is we're pointing out to the fact that uh, uh, Mahasiddhas have uh, gone to great lengths to accomplish their practice and uh, they're willing to uh, demonstrate their training and practice and they're willing to be transparent and seen and they're willing also sometimes to be um, uh, unconventional. <clears throat> so that's why I say, uh, if possible, we should have uh, nuns and monks and female and male householders, and we should also have yogis and mahasiddhas uh, uh, through Lions for our Dharma Center. Don't you think that would be a good idea? We'll make aspiration for that. <laughs> yeah. So it's not arrogant in our tradition to say, I want to be a Buddha, <laughs> you know, I want to be a Mahasiddha, uh, you know, or, or even I want to be an Arhat or I want to be a Bodhisattva. Uh, the only problem is if you're not working toward it, then uh, we might give you a hard time, but we want you to make the aspiration and we want to, you to know, uh, you know, what, uh, where you belong in your path. <clears throat> so the sense of belonging is extremely important because uh, most of the time when people are struggling with their lives, they're not sure where they belong. Like, do I belong with that person? Do I belong with uh, in this town? Do I belong in this group? Do I belong in this gender? Do I belong in this planet, right? So, uh, uh, traditionally in the Buddhist path, we have uh, tried to address this because we understand belonging and identity and freedom uh, all are linked together. So I'll say it again, the sense of belonging, knowing where you belong, sense of identity, who you are, and the sense of community are all uh, linked together. <clears throat> so we um, say we, but uh, I'm formulating Dharma as we're uh, in my lifetime too. So we, we came up with uh, a few uh, typologies or um, maps. Um, they're not rigid, uh, they're not absolute, but they're useful. And one is called the vehicles or the yanas. Uh, one is called um, the uh, families or the gotras. <clears throat> and Another one is called the scope, the scope of one's practice. <clears throat> so hopefully when we're doing our training and, and uh, performance during the day, uh, we know where we belong uh, so that we can accomplish that practice and become uh, a Mahasiddha, at least of that level, we could say. So you feel like, I accomplished that. I, be I was a success as an arhat or a householder or a bodhisattva or a uh, yogi or mahasiddha or a scholar like that. So the scope is something that people should be familiar with because uh, in the past uh, I've talked about it and Geshe Damchala has. So generally in, uh, there's three scopes. The small scope means we're just wanting to uh, have a good rebirth and have a pleasant life, which by the way is, uh, okay to hang out in, totally, right? Um, but uh, you say that uh, the small scope uh, cannot uh, be maintained um, forever and won't lead to permanent happiness and release because even though we build up a lot of positive potential uh, and we have a good rebirth, maybe even next time or the time after that, eventually uh, the circle goes around, the wheel turns and uh, we may end up you know, uh, living in a land uh, with, you know, undesirable people, right? So <clears throat> you may end up with a bunch of QAnon people <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, the second scope is medium scope. Medium scope is where we really do want our own liberation. Uh, we do want to really get out of uh, the cycle of confusion and desperation called samsara, but uh, the emphasis is uh, more focused on ourselves. Actually, we have to start there. 
right? Or we should actually start in a uh, small scope. We just, you know, want fairly okay life. And then we want to be liberated on top of that, which would be medium scope. We're uh, mainly focused on ourselves. And I think that's important. So uh, I don't like it when people skip scopes, actually. And uh, they try to uh, say, oh, I'm not important. I don't care about my own comfort and happiness. I'm not working for myself. I'm just working for others. Well, then they forget to go to the dentist, you know? They forget to take care of themselves or pay the rent or, or even worse, sometimes become a nuisance. So I want people to, um, you know, take care of themselves and to, to value their uh, precious human birth. So uh, I know the therapists in the audience know what I'm talking about, that, you know, it's hard to get someone to do some insight-oriented psychotherapy when people uh, are really in pain or, you know, real crisis, right? You have to get people to uh, do self-care. You have to, uh, you know, stable, have to develop some stabilization or get them in an environment where they're stable can't just immediately jump into insight. If someone's, you know, the Buddha said, if someone's starving, uh, you have to feed them food before you start preaching Dharma. Isn't that so? So I want people to have a uh, small scope, you know, say, I, I, want a, I want a pleasant life and I want a pleasant life for others and I want a good rebirth. And I do want to be liberated. I don't want to be chained to my ignorance. But the step beyond that is the Bodhisattva path uh, that uh, we see that others are suffering and it awakens in us the compassion that um, means that we have to become awake ourselves in order to best help others. So that's called uh, the great scope. <clears throat> I'd like to add uh, uh, two, two scopes to that. Um, one is like, present uh, scientific world, I would call like a secular scope. So um, there are many people that uh, they uh, are not approaching Dharma from a religious point of view or even fully buying it, but they're, uh, they're approaching it from a level of uh, experimentation and a level of investigation. And uh, they're maybe mixing it with other things but uh, and they don't know exactly what they want to do in life, but uh, they're using using the tools of Dharma combined with science and medicine and other uh, disciplines in order to uh, make things better. Uh, so uh, it's <laughs> the pretty small scope, but. Um, it doesn't have to define itself necessarily as Buddhist, right? So I welcome people, two lines or lines or Dharma Center in the temple who are investigation. Don't you think that's important? You know, we have that kind of opening. Then, but beyond Bodhisattva is like um, the Buddhiana scope, right? So uh, we're not, uh, the viewpoint has moved beyond uh, rescuing ourselves or saving or liberating, or rescuing ourselves or saving or liberating others. Um, we're beginning to identify more and more just with things as they are. We're more and more interested. Uh, we're doing individual liberation and secular work and bodhisattva work, but uh, uh, we're, we're more interested uh, in addition to uh, just uh, investigating how things actually are and appreciating how things actually are. So that's like the Buddhayana, where um, the momentum of the individual liberation and great liberation practices allows us to um, uh, begin appreciating things from a non-dualistic point of view. So uh, self and other um, are still present, but um, are uh, contained through a uh, greater sphere. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we call that uh, uh, the great expanse, right? Like Long Chen, right? Great expanse, not, uh, it doesn't have, it's not into like self and other, contains self or other, but uh, 
it's the great sphere or uh, the great expanse. <clears throat> The uh, gotras or the families uh, are enumerated mostly in Tantra. Um, uh, we use Samaja Tantra, um, the Dharma Tantra, uh, and Kala Chakra Tantra talk about different qualities, different aspects. Uh, I like talking about the Buddha families. One of the teachers that I studied with, Trung Fern Shea, liked talking about Buddha families. Um, many of the students have written uh, different descriptions, um, uh, even the Buddha families for knowing how to decorate your house and do feng shui like that. <laughs> I don't know if Yuri Samaj went that far, but in any case, um, uh, we have uh, five Buddha families and sometimes six. Uh, Vajrasattva is sometimes called six Buddha families or the combination of all the Buddha families. So uh, I'm glad we're doing a lot of Vajrasattva practice because uh, that. Uh, aspect is important to bring them all together. But the five Buddha families enumerate our different styles of uh, confusion, but also our different styles of realization. So when we're doing training and practice, um, more and more I'll be asking people like, uh, let's talk about your particular style. Let's talk about how you approach the world and the frame in which you see the world. So. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not quite psychological types, they're more elemental types. So the temptation, of course, in the West is comparing them to like, um, yeah, you know, Jungian typology, uh, you know, like, are you an INFJ? <laughs> That's kind of Myers-Biggs like that, or sometimes astrological categories, um, or other, um, things like uh, the Enneagram, right? Um, so when we were talking about the Buddha families, um, we're not talking about um, your uh, personal, uh, your persona energy. We're actually not talking about um, your uh, uh, ego energy, um, where uh, like a metaphor is, is like we're not talking about your house uh, we're talking about the fact that your house is on a fault okay you're on an earthquake fault and that that would be one kind of buddha family like you're living on the earthquake fault okay but your house is your personal world but your personal world is living on an earthquake fault right so the buddha families um like padma and ratna vajra karma and buddha, buddha family are not personality structures like Enneagram or astrology or uh, psychiatric DSM-5. They're like, uh, oh, you're, you're living on the ocean. <laughs> you're, you live on a houseboat and you're, you're on that element. You're on that situation or you're on the fault line or, oh, you're floating in outer space. You, you are, you're, your house, uh, your activity is in space, right? So uh, the Buddha families um, are something that uh, uh, turn into Buddhas in a sense, are transformed, but the important part is like you don't own it. As I said a lot of times, uh, we are it, but we don't own it. So I wanted to have a distinction made uh, between Buddha families and uh, your uh, personal neurosis. Um, Trung Param Shea spent a long time hanging out with um, psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, R.D. Lang was kind of somebody they'd hang out with. Uh, but uh, so you picked up these uh, psychoanalytic terms uh, like neurosis and ego and things like that and use them. And of course, that made us a little bit more interested. But um, uh, Buddha families actually are not uh, our personal neurosis. They're an earthquake fault, right? They're like the ocean, or uh, you're living in the jungle, or you're living in the desert, and uh, that's that kind of ground. <clears throat> so uh, it's important to recognize where where you're uh, living, where you kind of belong, where 
um, uh, you know, you're, you're placing your uh, persona and your identification in your uh, personal world. You're placing it on uh, these different aspects, these different elements like that. So uh, that uh, finding that sense of belonging is important uh, to do Tantra. Otherwise, um, we're like living in uh, uh, New Mexico uh, in the high desert, and then we're confused because we thought we were living on the water, you know? Or we're um, living in the jungle and we're sweating. And, uh, it's very humid, but for some strange reason, we thought we were uh, living in, in the desert. So that's how we get confused. <clears throat> Who does? Roberta. Roberta somewhere. Yes. So Lala, thank you um, for your teaching. When um, I think about the Buddha families, I certainly think I have all those fault lines. <laughs> so I guess my question would be, what, what, can you give an example of, you know, what an instruction might be from you that would, um, help in terms of knowing what our particular Buddha family um, fault line may be and how that, what you would tell us in, to enhance our practice as a result of that. Well, you, you, uh, we actually have to do a lot of meditation to um, not, uh, to be able to investigate properly. Um, because sometimes if we just say you're you're kind of this or that, then it's taken as a person and personal, like that's your personality. So right. um, you know uh, that's why uh, sometimes I'm just using metaphors of, uh, and sometimes they're not metaphors like you know where where are you actually living? You know you're living on the ocean. <laughs> you're living, you know. Uh, on the flatland, you're living in the mountains, right? Uh, what's your actual environment? What, what, where are you actually living and what's that like? So, um, you know, describing and uh, the actual space and environment in which uh, uh, you're, you're working with. So uh, not identifying it just with an internal state of mind, but um, a whole environment like that. Okay. Thank you. So a lot of times, yeah, we don't we don't know what environment we're in. Um, you know, we, we think we're in one environment because we have this uh, idea who we are, um, uh, but uh, that's not really the environment we're living in. So that we we want to bring those into congruence. So there's a sense of belonging. A lot of times, well, most of the time, we people feel like they don't belong because they they think. Internally, they're one place. Maybe they're still in their past life or something. They think they're in one place, but they're actually um, like here in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. like that. So, uh, uh, so much of the training and practice uh, is to uh, actually arrive where you really are <clears throat> and start from there. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. I have some more to say too, but is there, now we're pausing. For, we ought to give someone else a chance if there's a question, comment, or complaint. <clears throat> mm. So the Mahasiddhas um, traditionally have um, uh, you know, powers, right? Uh, they're described um, through the literature and uh, through having powers. So not just um, being awake, um, but uh, I thought I'd go over some of the powers with you and uh, uh, talk about that significance. So uh, sometimes there are eight powers, uh, sometimes there are different lists of eight powers, sometimes unlimited powers. Uh, Definitely one of the powers is clairvoyance, you know, seeing uh, things, uh, you know, with, uh, in the future or further down the road, so to speak. 
Uh, one of the powers traditionally is invisibility. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the powers of uh, being able to dematerialize and rematerialize, um, uh, like walking through walls or um, one of the uh, a famous photo of the uh, uh, 16th Karmapa was uh, uh, catching him uh, while he's dematerializing like that. You know, that goes beyond the realm of ordinary science, right? But uh, there it is, you know. Uh, and then uh, we can manifest in many different bodies and uh, we can um, bilocate. <clears throat> then, uh, you know, one of the Ma Mahasiddha uh, power cities, of course, is like flying. So uh, Nilarepa, for example, was, um, you know, famous for being able to fly. So uh, and recently in um, Tibet, there there's still been examples of people flying. So uh, sometimes, sometimes you see teachers like, well, we'll put out the Zen like this and <laughs> see what happens, right? Have you ever seen that, you know, like a photo of teacher like, okay, so. <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, this uh, immortality, right? You know, so long life and immortality would be a city <clears throat> Additional ones would be like speed walking, the ability to really um, move fast through a territory, actually. Um, this was talked about in one of the early books I read, uh, which was fun. Uh, Alexander David Neal's very intrepid French woman who went to Tibet and saw examples of speed walking. Uh, and, you know, of course, memory of past lives, being able to remember. Um, we didn't pass lives, um, even remembering what we did yesterday. <laughs> that would be good. Uh, then, then divine ear. So one of the cities would be able to um, uh, hear what others are saying, even though they're speaking a different language. And of course, the uh, uh, ability to uh, speak in your own language and everybody would hear it in their own language too. So these uh, are some of the examples of cities. Uh, some cities that have also become popular um, uh, when people are doing uh, uh, high-level practices. Uh, people have heard about, um, you know, Rainbow Body, uh, where some teachers are able to um, uh, completely dissolve into the elements. Uh, and, uh, just their robes are left. Um, that's like a great Jalu, great rainbow body, also <laughs> lesser, which is still quite something. Sometimes uh, teachers will, um, you know, be they will shrink down to like very small size, like that. Um, there's just too many uh, incidences for these to be. Um, uh, some of these may be metaphorical, but some of them actually have been observed. So uh, we'll have to have a discussion between the yogis and the scientists uh, that at some point that would be interesting. So uh, I have a book um, that actually written by a Catholic priest who uh, investigated uh, uh, this, this ability, a whole book of investigations up into uh, Rainbow Body, quite interesting. <clears throat> so the, the significance of these cities is um, showing that uh, uh, a Mahasiddha approach uh, is extremely flexible and uh, extremely compassionate and is willing to manifest in any form and is willing to develop any powers to uh, benefit others. Uh, and it epitomizes the sense of um, uh, the fluid and the transforming uh, part or I should not part it's it's the mind the nature of reality is fluid and transformative and uh, their whole lives are a uh, demonstration of this uh, so 
I know many people in the Sangha complain that um, <laughs> we're changing things um, or why does Lama do that or do that? Well, most of the time I'm responding to uh, situations because situations, particularly health situations change uh, sometimes rapidly or don't, but also um, the uh, nature of our existence is uh, this continuity of uh, uh, fluid transformation and the uh, practice and the training is to harmonize with this. Uh, so uh, things from Buddhist point of view are not static. Uh, they're spacious and they're open and uh, they're, they are uh, in many ways predictable, but uh, they're also uh, transformative and sometimes uh, shocking and sometimes uh, 180 like that. So that's why I ultimately say that our practice here has to be Mahasiddha practice uh, because uh, we have to be training for the real world. The real world is very changeable, very fluid, very transformative, but it does have a sense of continuity. There is a continuity of enlightened awareness. There's a continuity of balance and compassion that uh, we are and we can manifest. But uh, to really be uh, Buddhas, to really be Mahasiddhas, uh, we ourselves must learn how to harmonize and manifest uh, this very uh, fluid and transformative uh, reality that we are. Um, if uh, you're looking for certainty and looking for not change uh, in the conventional way, um, uh, I'm very interested where you would actually find it. <laughs> so uh, many times when I was studying uh, with my teacher, he'd say, well, I, I want you to go out and find yourself. And when you go out and find certainty uh, in the phenomenal or samsaric world, then please bring it to me. I'd be interested. <laughs> so uh, in Dharma, we uh, develop a certainty and of course a stability, but uh, it's, it's different than the normal kind of dualistic consciousness. And this stability actually uh, looks like some kind of unpredictability from uh, the uh, dualistic point of view, but actually it's uh, entirely consistent with its own nature. So uh, it's 12 o'clock. I'd like to stop and see if there's anything uh, people would like to comment on before we uh, uh, close. <clears throat> Say again. Roberta had asked in the comments if you could give a reading reference, like a book reference for the Mahasiddha powers. The Mahasiddha powers. Um, you mean like, um, you know, kind of uh, incidents or that people have recorded or things like that? Yeah. Mm. So, uh, Traditionally, these would be called like sometimes namtar, like liberation stories, which um, uh, are very classical. So, uh, you know, reading the life of uh, Gurumshe Padmasambhavas would be very traditional, uh, along with the Buddha's life, who had many miraculous demonstrations, and reading um, uh, other namtar or uh, uh, biographies of teachers, which are all available. And, but a lot of this is, um, a lot of the stories about teachers are kind of in the oral tradition and uh, remembered or written down and kind of scattered away like that. <clears throat> so uh, that's kind of an interesting question. I, I, don't, I don't think there's like, other than like the 84 Mahasiddha is the classical text, which has all kinds of things. I, I don't know if there's kind of like, uh, one book which would say, okay, these these uh, Mahasiddhas manifested this kind of activity. The ultimate uh, city is uh, uh, realization, is awakening, is enlightenment. So um, 
sometimes people that are considered to be Buddhas are um, they are very ordinary and they don't uh, appear to have any um, you know powers or manifestations at all, right? They're just being uh, you know very conventional or ordinary, um, but uh, somehow they're able to create um, peace and harmony and dynamism around them. But uh, and it comes out in their students. So they themselves are uh, uh, not so fancy that way, but but some people are fancy. So that's a good question. We'll maybe look for that. It'd be good. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I have a question. Are these powers developed intentionally or they are developed spontaneously? Or they also require the guru's blessings? Or can unsavory people develop them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's many cautionary tales of uh, unsavory uh, <laughs> use, you know? So. Um, that's why this, uh, they have to be uh, combined with a deep bodhicitta and a deep uh, renunciation, right? So if they're um, based on selfish purposes, uh, really dangerous, you know? So of course, one of the powers um, didn't mention is like the magical power to hypnotize or entrance people. So uh, many, uh, people have uh, politicians were easy to point at, right? Have the ability to entrance us and uh, to uh, speak to our fears or speak to our desires, and uh, we create all kinds of problems. Uh, you know, we find that with all kinds of people that we've been entranced or bewitched, right? So it can be used, you know, for sorcery like that. <clears throat> I would think. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just. I would think that it would come back to them really strongly <laughs> if they do that. Well, um, yeah. I mean, we have this idea of karma and cause and effect, um, and we always think uh, like John Lennon is going to be instant karma, but uh, uh, in our lifetimes, you know, it, it appears many times that sorcerers and uh, can get away with a lot, right? And they don't seem to have any, in this lifetime, any kind of um, karmic justice, right? Mm -hmm. So we have we have to take the long view like that. <clears throat> but uh, from a tantric practice point of view, um, uh, we try to see the world as both from the standpoint of cause and effect and uh, magical at the same time uh magical in the sense that we're bringing uh, a magical view not magical thinking as we'd say in psychiatry but uh, a magical view that oh you did it that way <laughs> so that's my one of my basic mantras when i'm busy being abbot of lines are like oh you did it that way <laughs> okay so uh we're having the sense of um, uh, awe and appreciation and surprise um, and like that. Sometimes uh, the best uh, Dzogchen approach is just say ah three times, right? Ah, <laughs> don't say anything else. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't work well probably in corporate meetings, but you know, it does work well. <laughs> it doesn't work in the state maybe like that. So um, these these powers uh, a lot of times just express itself through the ability, as um, uh, Jigme Lingpa said, uh, just changing one uh, negative thought to a positive thought. Right? It's kind of magical. So uh, we have a beautiful all gold tank of Jigme Lingpa uh, in the dome here. So. Uh, who's known for being great Terton, right? Treasure revealer, um, but also said the, uh, the real miracle is changing one negative thought to, uh, or, or liberating a negative thought like that. 
and we're really pissed off and we feel betrayed and screwed over, um, we can appreciate that that's a real miracle, right? <clears throat> so uh, this uh, Mahasiddha approach is one of journey, not just one of uh, arrival uh, or a parking lot. Uh, the journey uh, is an ongoing sense of belonging uh, uh, wherever we show up. So uh, it's not based on a um, uh, sense of territory um, or club like that, um, which is our normal way of establishing a sense of continuity and a sense of belonging, but uh, is uh, approached as a sense of uh, ongoing journey like that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else before we say goodbye? Yeah, I had my hand raised. This is Susan. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I didn't really have a comment, but I do have a request. Um, I'm an official request to have some teachings on the Buddha families. What you were right. saying today is information that I have not run across before. So yeah. I would really love to have some teachings on the Buddha families. Okay. Thank you. Will do. And what? Uh, so, um, yeah. So um, the Buddha families uh, is a, a tantric approach. And... Um, uh it's it's best approach when uh you know we're uh regarding ourselves as uh tantricas right so um in some sense uh uh tantricas and mahasiddhas are a little bit synonymous mahasiddhas would um you know uh, go to the actual accomplisher the mastery tantricas we could be beginning or middle uh but uh tantricas uh of course, we're we're having a special practice, a special Mahayana practice of of pure view, uh, and uh, you know, recognizing that uh, if we uh, don't maintain that pure view, that uh, the tantric practice uh, isn't happening. So the difficulty with tantric practice is you have to see one's lama and oneself and one sangha from uh, uh, a pure view uh, without uh, judgment and um, to uh, regard your teacher from the aspect of being Buddha. And uh, that's very difficult in the West, you see, um, because we identify um, a realization with a personality like that. Of course, it's nice to have a nice personality. It's nice to have a nice teacher that has a nice personality. Um, uh, but uh, the person, um, the person is not the Buddha like that. So uh, uh, I will be giving some more teachings on uh, and talking about what it is to be uh, a tantrika, uh, really uh, yogi tantrika, uh, and, and lion soar, and that would involve um, you know talking about the five Buddha families. Yeah, so uh, I do, I do want to turn out some tantricas from uh, Lion's Roar, So I'm glad you uh, asked that question, made that request like that. <clears throat> Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? And then I'll say goodbye. Okay, announcements. What am I saying? Uh, next Saturday, it's on the calendar about the recitation of the So I'm being reminded very nicely. So uh, next Saturday, uh, Dirk will be leading recitation of the Dulama, the Taratanta Shastra, um, reading it out loud. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, is really important and delightful. and if Dirk wants to say something about that, that's fine too. So, yeah, I was going to say something, Lama. Uh, the uh, everybody, anybody who wants to read part of it is welcome to. Uh, 
we're going to divide the text up among us. So if you would like to read part, lead, be the reader for part of the text, please uh, email me by Thursday, preferably by say midnight Wednesday, uh, so that I can divide the text up and give parts to everybody. Good. So, uh, uh, why why should we do that? Yeah. So, um, the uh, Shasta uh, is from the third turning of the wheel and is very positive and necessary uh, elucidation of the powers and the qualities of. Uh, uh, Buddha, and uh, it's a necessary foundation to actually do Tantra and to uh, um, understand fully what we're doing. Um, tantra in, involves um, uh, many commitments and uh, challenges. Uh, it's mountain climbing. So uh, if we don't have uh, an understanding of the ground, uh, that we're starting from. If our feet are not on the ground, uh, we won't make it up the mountain and we'll slip into the crevasse because um, the difficulties will uh, lead to disappointments instead of inspirations. So um, uh, it's very important to uh, uh, have the Buddha qualities it's kind of just like you're going through all this and you just remember that uh, you're loved and lovable, you see, because under stress, people forget that they're lovable. They forget that they're worthy of love and sometimes they forget to give love. So the Uttara Tantra uh, coming from Maitreya, you know, loving Buddha is, is really just saying Beatles song over and over, you know, all these qualities uh, that are expressed, but it's still, Obviously, love, love, love. So you're lovable, and uh, you're uh, capable of uh, giving love, and uh, we love to have you around <laughs> like that, right? So you, otherwise, dharma can become too cognitive and kind of self-improvey, and then it just becomes a drag, right? So you spend too much time uh, figuring things out in our daily lives. And uh, you know, too much time worrying about if we're okay. <laughs> so we we need to um, uh, you know resolve that. So when you're climbing the mountain, you don't uh, slip into the crevasse, and you can enjoy the view, right? So uh, uh, that's that's why the the shastra and those uh, the Tathagata Garbha texts uh, the accompanying it are are so important. <clears throat> So I have a short announcement. Um, I'm bringing uh, for the altar. Um, uh, I'm opening up my, this is a very pretty one, isn't it? This is some, from Santa Fe. There's a small uh, uh, Tibetan group in Santa Fe. So uh, got that there last time. And then I have this book. It's, it's wrapped up in, uh, 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 a wrap that I made myself, and uh, that I I also used uh, to do um, my mandala offering in, you know, like this, and you put it over here. Um, so it's in my lap like that. So uh, as a newcomer. To Dharma, this is like mm, 30 years ago, uh, doing <laughs> Sundra. This is not what you want to do. First of all, this is slippery. <laughs> so when you put rice in it, everything slips off. And then second, it's too small. So the mandala aprons are bigger and they're coarser. So when you like dump the mandala back in, uh, it doesn't all slip off, right? Some of you may know about, you know, you're, you're doing, you have a mandala plate and doing all the 
meditations and then you're putting on the rings and then you start all over again. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, but it's not fun when it spills out all over the place. So uh, when people are ready to do that, I will give you the correct teaching on uh, so the right <laughs> the right way to do it. But that's not the gift. So um, I wanted to bring this today. I'll wrap it back up. But this is a copy of um, uh, some of the uh, verses from the Bodhicari Vitara. Um, and uh, uh, of course, with commentary by uh, Dalai Lama. So it, uh, can you, I don't know, can you see opening up correctly? No, no, you can't see? No. I can see the pages, but not what's on them. Yeah, so a little, like, I'm just going through the page. Well, something, I'm being silly. So this is, something's magically happening here. Here's the forward. And then here's acknowledgments. And then here's translator's notes. And then, then you should see like some scribble. Who knows what that is? Come on, you guys, who, knew, who knows what that is? Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's Dalai Lama's signature, real signature, real pen, real Dalai Lama's signature, okay? There are many Dalai Lama signatures, copies, this is actual. So this book went all the way from Sacramento to McLeod Ganj and uh, get signed and then sent back. Isn't that amazing? So I'm gonna put it up there on the altar. So I have, um, my old student, Mary Fisher, to thank for that. Uh, she's passed away, but um, I remember her well. And I said, Mary, that's really amazing. You know, like you just sent the book and you asked for the signature. And she says, well, I said very nice things. And I go, well, that's nice. And she said, I also enclosed $500 in cash. <laughs> so it worked. <laughs> so we'll, we'll put this on the altar. For safekeeping. Okay, so let's do uh, prayers and dedication now. Okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, bodhicitta, that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Tenzin Jatso, please remain until some sorrow ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Bosang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, people uh, in person in the future when we're a little higher uh, color level so that we're uh, all safe. And um, uh, a little shout out, uh, Ellen uh, said that there might be a possibility of doing a one day retreat at uh, Lotus View uh, next month. So I'll be talking to her about that. Um, that would be very nice to be outside uh, doing some uh, 
practices that involve the sky. So maybe <laughs> we can do that. And uh, I'm looking forward also to doing some animal blessings and some animal liberation like that. So um, please be nice to animals and uh, eat eat as few of them as you can, okay? Like that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, thanks, Norris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Lama. Thank you. Bye, Jack. Thank you, Lama. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank, Thank you, you Lama. Lama. Thank you, Friday. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. Uh, the lions are a logo. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully, be talking to some of you soon. Ciao. I'll sign off now. <laughs>